Special Report. Margaret Chase Smith gives a speech on the floor of the Senate, 1st of June, 1950. The last 72 hours in the United States has witnessed history in the making. And a population unraveling. Part of that has included frequent references to a woman. A Republican senator from Maine. Who in 1950 was the only voice to stand up and speak against Joe McCarthy. Six male senators signed her statement in agreement. None spoke. This weekend, more than a few grinning politicians compared the current senator from Maine, Susan Collins, and her speech cementing Brett Kavanaugh's place on the Supreme Court, to that solemn voice from another trying era of American history, and the speech she gave on the floor of the Senate in 1950. This comparison could not be more flawed. It is easy to find recordings of Collins's October 6, 2018 speech. There are none of Margaret Chase Smith's Declaration of Conscience. The Craft Lit Podcast accepts that challenge. In 1950 America, the war had been won. The economy was growing. Babies were booming. But the Yalta Agreement left wounds of frustration in those who felt FDR had been too weak, too generous with Russia. Our view of Russia's part in the agreement was of its dangerous expansionism. Their view was one of trying to build a protective buffer against another future German attack. Reasonable people can. And did. Disagree. But the vacuum left behind as the unity of World War II faded was bound to be filled with something just as strong. Fear. You will hear this in Margaret Chase Smith's speech. You will hear her anger at those who stoke fear for fear's sake. On both sides of the aisle. But she has no patience for those who manipulate the public by stoking a fear of the other. She has no patience for the tricks of political gain or expediency. Which serves to feed the maw of one party at the expense of the unity of the country. And in our craftlit way of looking at literature and history, it is apparent that Margaret Chase Smith nicely dovetails our beliefs. Context is everything. Reasonable people can disagree respectfully. No one. No party. No country. No author. No character worth reading about. Is perfect or infallible. At first you may hear statements that validate Mitch McConnell's fawning comparison of Susan Collins' speech to Margaret Chase Smith's. Keep listening. Margaret Chase Smith, like Mark Twain in A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, works her argument until precious few are free of her piercing, unwavering stare. And, like Twain, she looks not only out at others, but in a mirror, too. The current Republican Party, Susan Collins, Mitch McConnell, Donald Trump, are simply not Margaret Chase Smith honest. Not Margaret Chase Smith strong. Margaret Chase Smith was the most important mid-century giant of the Senate you've never heard of. After you listen, we hope you will go and learn all you can about her. Maybe put a pillow under your jaw, though. It's bound to drop a few times. Mr. President, I would like to speak briefly and simply about a serious national condition. It is a national feeling of fear and frustration that could result in national suicide and the end of everything that we Americans hold dear. It is a condition that comes from the lack of effective leadership in either the legislative branch or the executive branch of our government. That leadership is so lacking that serious and responsible proposals are being made that national advisory commissions be appointed to provide such critically needed leadership. I speak as briefly as possible because too much harm has already been done with irresponsible words of bitterness and selfish political opportunism. I speak as briefly as possible because the issue is too great to be obscured by eloquence. I speak simply and briefly in the hope that my words will be taken to heart. I speak as a Republican. 
I speak as a woman. I speak as a United States senator. I speak as an American. The United States Senate has long employed worldwide respect as the greatest deliberative body in the world. But recently, that deliberative character has too often been debased to the level of a forum of hate and character assassination sheltered by the shield of congressional immunity. It is ironical that we senators can, in debate, in the Senate, directly or indirectly, by any form of words, impute to any American who is not a senator any conduct or motive unworthy or unbecoming an American. And without that non-senator American having any legal redress against us. Yet, if we say the same thing in the Senate about our colleagues, we can be stopped on the grounds of being out of order. It is strange that we can verbally attack anyone else without restraint and with full protection, and yet we hold ourselves above the same type of criticism here on the Senate floor. Surely the United States Senate is big enough to take self-criticism and self-appraisal. Surely we should be able to take the same kind of character attacks that we dish out to outsiders. I think that it is high time for the United States Senate and its members to do some soul-searching, for us to weigh our consciences on the manner in which we are performing our duty to the people of America, on the manner in which we are using or abusing our individual powers and privileges. I think that it is high time that we remembered that we have sworn to uphold and defend the Constitution. I think that it is high time that we remembered the Constitution as amended speaks not only of the freedom of speech, but also of trial by jury instead of trial by accusation. Whether it be a criminal prosecution in court or a character prosecution in the Senate, there is little practical distinction when the life of a person has been ruined. Those of us who shout the loudest about Americanism in making character assassinations are all too frequently those who, by our own words and acts, ignore some of the basic principles of Americanism. The right to criticize. The right to hold unpopular beliefs. The right to protest. The right of independent thought. The exercise of these rights should not cost one single American citizen his reputation or his right to a livelihood nor should he be in danger of losing his reputation or livelihood merely because he happens to know someone who holds unpopular beliefs. Who of us doesn't? Otherwise, none of us could call our souls our own. Otherwise, thought control would have set in. The American people are sick and tired of being afraid to speak their minds lest they be politically smeared as communists, or fascists by their opponents. Freedom of speech is not what it used to be in America. It has been so abused by some that it is not exercised by others. The American people are sick and tired of seeing innocent people smeared and guilty people whitewashed. But there have been enough proved cases, such as the Amerasia case, the Hiss case, the Coplon case, the Gold case, to cause the nationwide distrust and strong suspicion that there may be something to the unproved, sensational accusations. As a Republican, I say to my colleagues on this side of the aisle that the Republican Party faces a challenge today that is not unlike the challenge that it faced back in Lincoln's day. The Republican Party so successfully met that challenge that it emerged from the Civil War as the champion of a united nation, in addition to being a party that unrelentingly fought loose spending and loose programs. Today, our country is being psychologically divided by the confusion and the suspicions that are bred in the United States Senate to spread like cancerous tentacles of know-nothing, suspect-everything attitudes. 
Today, we have a democratic administration that has developed a mania for loose spending and loose programs. History is repeating itself. And the Republican Party again has the opportunity to emerge as the champion of unity and prudence. The record of the present democratic administration has provided us with sufficient campaign issues without the necessity of resorting to political smears. America is rapidly losing its position as the leader of the world simply because the Democratic administration has pitifully failed to provide effective leadership. The Democratic administration has completely confused the American people by its daily contradictory grave warnings and optimistic assurances that show the people that our Democratic administration has no idea of where it is going. The Democratic administration has greatly lost the confidence of the American people by its complacency to the threat of communism here at home and the leak of vital secrets to Russia through key officials of the Democratic administration. There are enough proved cases to make this point without diluting our criticism with unproved charges. Surely, These are sufficient reasons to make it clear to the American people that it is time for a change and that a Republican victory is necessary to the security of this country. Surely it is clear that this nation will continue to suffer as long as it is governed by the present ineffective democratic administration. Yet, to displace it, with a Republican regime embracing a philosophy that lacks political integrity or intellectual honesty, would prove equally disastrous to this nation. The nation sorely needs a Republican victory, but I don't want to see the Republican Party ride to political victory on the four horsemen of calumny. Fear, ignorance, bigotry, and smear. I doubt if the Republican Party could simply because I don't believe the American people will uphold any political party that puts political exploitation above national interest. And surely we Republicans aren't that desperate for victory. I don't want to see the Republican Party win that way. While it might be a fleeting victory for the Republican Party, it would be a more lasting defeat for the American people. Surely it would ultimately be suicide for the Republican Party and the two-party system that has protected our American liberties from the dictatorship of a one-party system. As members of the minority party, we do not have the primary authority to formulate the policy of our government, but we do have the responsibility of rendering constructive criticism, of clarifying issues, of allaying fears by acting as responsible citizens. As a woman, I wonder how the mothers, wives, sisters, and daughters feel about the way in which members of their families have been politically mangled in Senate debate. And I use the word debate advisedly. As a United States Senator, I am not proud of the way in which the Senate has been made a publicity platform for irresponsible sensationalism. I am not proud of the reckless abandon in which unproved charges have been hurled from this side of the aisle. I am not proud of the obviously staged, undignified countercharges that have been attempted in retaliation from the other side of the aisle. I don't like the way the Senate has been made a rendezvous for vilification, for selfish political gain at the sacrifice of individual reputations and national unity. I am not proud of the way we smear outsiders from the floor of the Senate and hide behind the cloak of congressional immunity and still place ourselves beyond criticism on the floor of the Senate. As an American, I am shocked at the way Republicans and Democrats alike are playing directly into the communist design of confuse, divide, and conquer. As an American, I don't want a democratic administration whitewash or cover up any more than I want a Republican smear or witch hunt. As an American, I condemn a Republican fascist just as much as I condemn a democratic communist. 
I condemn a democratic fascist just as much as I condemn a Republican communist. They are equally dangerous to you and me and to our country. As an American, I want to see our nation recapture the strength and unity it once had when we fought the enemy instead of ourselves. It is with these thoughts that I have drafted what I call a Declaration of Conscience. I am gratified that Senator Toby, Senator Aiken, Senator Morse, Senator Ives, Senator Thigh, and Senator Hendrickson have concurred in that declaration and have authorized me to announce their concurrence. The declaration reads as follows. One, we are Republicans, but we are Americans first. It is as Americans that we express our concern with the growing confusion that threatens the security and stability of our country. Democrats and Republicans alike have contributed to that confusion. Two, the Democratic administration has initially created the confusion by its lack of effective leadership, by its contradictory grave warnings and optimistic assurances, by its complacency to the threat of communism here at home, by its oversensitivities to rightful criticism, by its petty bitterness against its critics. Three, certain elements of the Republican Party have materially added to this confusion in the hopes of riding the Republican Party to victory through the selfish political exploitation of fear, bigotry, ignorance, and intolerance. There are enough mistakes of the Democrats for Republicans to criticize constructively without resorting to political smears. Four, to this extent, Democrats and Republicans alike have unwittingly, but undeniably, played directly into the communist design of confuse, divide, and conquer. Five, it is high time that we stopped thinking politically as Republicans and Democrats about elections and started thinking patriotically as Americans about national security based on individual freedom it is high time that we all stopped being tools and victims of totalitarian techniques. Techniques that, if continued here unchecked, will surely end what we have come to cherish as the American way of life. During her speech, which never identifies him by name. Joe McCarthy quietly got up and left the Senate chamber. <laughs> 